Good morning, church. It is great to be here. Amen? He has done great things. I, um, I love this scripture. Romans 7. It's beautiful. What I want to do today in just a few minutes, so I'm going to really try to do this in just a few minutes, is I want us to understand the work of Jesus and what he did and the work of the Spirit and what the Spirit is doing. Um, as we grow in Christ, if we grasp these realities, the work that Jesus did on the cross and the work of God that he is doing through the Spirit in our lives, we're going to bear fruit for God. Bearing fruit is the result of the Spirit of God at work in our lives. What Jesus has done for us on the cross, he died for our sins. God made him who knew no sin to be sin's punishment or penalty for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Everybody right now say, I'm a child of God. It's an incredible inheritance that you have. I was telling my Bible class this morning, we don't go from being a child of God to not a child of God and then back into a standing of being a child of God and then now, all right, now because of this and we're not a child of God, we're going back and forth, being whipsawed in life. That is not who we are. Satan would love for us to have that perspective about our walk with the Lord. That walk is defined by one simple emotion and that is called fear. We know that perfect love casts out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. Jesus has loved us perfectly. I shared with my Bible class this morning of a horrible act that I carried out when I was a teenager that my mother recognized before I had even confessed my sin. We are driving down the road, and she saw something. I, I won't tell you the whole story, but she saw something in our community that used to be in its right location and now was laid over in a pasture that some young men had been involved in. And she, we were on our way to church on a Sunday morning. As we turned left to go to the church, that billboard sign that we cut down the night before with a handsaw. <laughs> Don't do that. Me and some other buddies, like we went from one bad thing to the next bad thing, and it was so much fun. I mean, we just kept like getting bigger and bigger in our bad behavior. And my mother, on our way to church, she looks over and she sees that big, huge billboard sign with telephone poles laid over on the ground, and immediately she looks back at me and gave me that mama knows look. Y'all know the Shenandoah song, Mama Knows. Mama, I won't sing it anymore. Even when I think she doesn't know, she's got a window to my soul, Mama Knows, or something like that. Anyway, she looked at me. I didn't have to confess. The confession just occurred. But while Bible class was going on, I was in confession with my father. Are y'all following this? I didn't make the youth group that morning to class. Here's what did not happen. I did not go from being arch... Well, I didn't drop a plate either, but that's okay too. It's all good, church. Every, everybody's good. We're all good. I did not go from being Arch McCord's son to not being Arch McCord's son. Now, he might have wanted to disown me in that moment. And those of us that are parents, we get that. But I didn't go from, from being his son to no longer being his son and trying to earn favor. Do you hear me? to get back into good graces so that I could reestablish my, my status as my dad's son. I was my dad's son before, and I was my dad's son after, and I was, I, I was my, da my dad's son. I was going to say I'm, I, was my, I, was my I was a dead son. <laughs> I was blind, but now I see. You know, so we, we had to go, you know, we all confessed, me and my buddies, and there was restitution, and we rebuilt, had a re we, we paid the penalty of our sin. Okay, we did all of that. My point is, I didn't go from being a son to losing that sonship. Church family, when we are under grace, we don't go in and out of grace. 
We are under the grace of Jesus Christ. We are either under the law of sin and death or we're under the law of the Spirit. It's incredibly important for us to understand um, the new way of the Spirit. I, I'm glad that's there because when I put this slide together, the new way of the Spirit, and, the, and I was just wondering, I was like, man, what's John talking about? The, this is, all, <laughs> the new way of the Spirit has been in the Bible for 2,000 years. It's just, I don't know that Christians have always understood the blessing of God's Spirit. And I know that, that recently I've been talking a lot about this in, in different ways, and it's almost like some people may think, can we get on with it? Well, we will get on with it when we are grasped by the Spirit of God. Here's why this is so important. What Jesus did on the cross saved us. What the Spirit is doing in our life is producing good works so that we can become like Jesus. And we are empowered to carry out His ministry through us. Without the Spirit of God at work in our lives, we cannot become like Jesus. That's why Paul confronted the Galatian church. And he says this, tell me, how is it that you began in the Spirit, but you're now trying to finish by means of keeping the rules? Or his way of saying it is, you began in the Spirit, now you're trying to finish by means of the flesh. Your human capacity. So what we understand is the Spirit of God is bringing us from glory to glory. He is progressively making us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And I want us to understand that the Spirit given to us in the last days, in the age of the church, we read about that in Acts chapter 2, is not, what do we call, an amendment to the New Testament Constitution. Can I put it that way? The Spirit is not an appendix. It's not an amendment. It's not a bill of rights that's added on. It's not a little extra that God gives you. The Spirit is the central piece of the age in which you and I are in. And without the Spirit, we cannot become like Christ, and we cannot carry out the ministry for which God has called us to do in the church. And I'm waiting on an amen. This was anticipated by Jesus, and I want you to see this. I said it's not a central piece. The cross carried out our salvation. The Spirit carries out empowerment for the church. Go to uh, John chapter 7. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7, and I want to point out just a couple of texts uh, from John chapter 7. I want you to see these verses, a couple of verses. All right, here we go. At verse um, 37, I'm sorry. <clears throat> John 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, talking about the festival, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. There were three main Jewish festivals, Passover, Pentecost and the the uh, the feast of the tabernacles okay the, uh, the the great ceremony of tabernacles and I'm going to explain it in just a moment so this is tabernacles and I'm going to explain what that means on the last and greatest day of the festival Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice <laughs> you just have no idea how funny this is when you understand what Jesus did okay let me, let me stop right here. I got to tell you about the Feast of Tabernacles because you're, you're just not going to get it until you understand what's going on here. All right, every day during the Feast of Tabernacles, there would be a great procession from the temple. That's the booze, uh, the tabernacle. That's what the tabernacle would look. These little fixed huts. They would gather in Jerusalem. They would make these little makeshift tents. It was a reminder of that they were on a journey through the wilderness and got to the promised land. And, and, uh, and they would have these. It was the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, on this, during this seven-day feast, every morning at the break of dawn, a huge procession would begin at the temple, and they would make their way down. It's about three football fields long, about 300 yards. But it was, but it was a big drop-off down into a canyon. Where at the bottom of the canyon, there's this pool of Siloam. 
And so they would make their way all the way down, and, and, the, and the, the high priest would lead the procession. The Levites would be playing all of their musical instruments. Uh, it would just be a, it, it was, the Feast of Tabernacles was to be a joyful, joyful occasion. Um, as a matter of fact, when they would celebrate in the evenings during the Feast of Tabernacles, the leading people, uh, uh, the aristocracy of the Jews, so you're, it'd be the elders of the church, there, I can put it that way. How about that? The elders of the church would be dancing and leading the dances in the courts of the temple. They'd be leading the party. That's what I'm trying to say. It was a great party, and they knew how to party. And so, anyway, the, the way every day began with a party, a procession, down to the Pool of Siloam, and then they would make their way back up, and they would sing the Hallel hymns. I know I'm being a little Bible nerd here, but Psalms 113 through 118, they would sing these Hallel hymns as they made their way back up to the Temple Mount and they would take a little golden jar and they would dip water out of the Pool of Siloam and then they would carry this jar all the way up, back up to the Temple, into the South Gate and then they would go up there and they would go to the altar in front of the Temple and then they would, the, all the congregation would yell out, Raise your hand! And then the priest would raise his hand and he would pour the water out, which was symbolic of the day in which God would pour out his spirit. On the seventh day, the greatest day of the feast, so as they came up, they got to the altar, they would march one time around the altar. Hold your hand up. The priest holds it up and he pours the water out, symbolizing the hope of the messianic gift of the, of the Spirit. He would pour the water out, and on the seventh day, they would march around the altar seven times. So on the last and greatest day, they've marched around the altar on the seven times. Hold your hands up for the priest to hold him up. Now, this is when Jesus begins to speak. Jesus is not an official Levitical priest. He's not the high priest. Have y'all ever been to a sporting event, maybe a football game or a baseball game, and the game is going on, and someone takes their clothes off and begins running across the field? You've at least watched that on TV, right, before? And you immediately think, that's not normal. That's what not what normally happens at a baseball game. This is weird. This person is stealing the show. Jesus has his clothes on. I just want to be clarify. I don't want to get in trouble with the elders later today. He does have his clothes on. But what he does is as out of place as somebody running on the field naked. It does not belong in the ceremony. This is what Jesus says. He says, let it, he, he says with a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, John says, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. We know from our Lord and Savior that he anticipated giving us the greatest of gifts, and that is God's Spirit. And he said, anyone who believes in me, right? Living water, let anyone who is thirsty. That's, that, is from, that echoes Isaiah 55, verse 1 of the prophet. In Isaiah chapter 12 there's also a connection. Let me, let me share that with you for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 1. In that day, when a king is given that comes from the root of Jesse, the Messiah from David, in that day, you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the God himself, is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Verse 3, here it is. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So Isaiah had talked about it there in chapter 12. 
Israel had anticipated the Feast of Tabernacles. I wish I had time to give you some more background about this expectation of the giving of the Spirit. Jesus, y'all remember the conversation he has with the woman at the well? So this was John 7. So back in John 4, he encounters the woman at the well. Do you remember what he says? If you'd ask me, I would give you living water. What was he talking about? He's talking about the Spirit. The giving of the Spirit is front and central to the ministry of Jesus. Jesus completes his ministry on the cross with the death, burial, and resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, he tells the apostles, Remain in Jerusalem until I pour out my Spirit. And when I do, you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Joel, 700 years had prophesied before the day of Pentecost. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Um, in the last days, verse 17. In the last days. See, so we have the water pouring ceremony. I want you to say so the priest is pouring out the water at the altar at the, at the tabernacle ceremony. The, 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 uh, the, water cere- the water pouring ceremony. And there's this expectation. It's a remembrance of what God had done in the wilderness when Moses um, uh, struck the rock and the waters came out and God watered Israel there in the garden. And so there was this connection between water and spirit. As a matter of fact, I didn't share with you this part, but I think it's really important. As the pilgrims would make their way from the pool of Siloam up to the temple, they carried these things called lulavs. And it was just um, some brush that was about that tall in their hands, some brush that was stuck together. And in the procession, on certain steps, as the Levites stepped, they would wave their brush. Have y'all ever waved a stick before? Some of you are strong enough to wave a bat really fast. What does a bat sound like when it goes really fast? It's like, right? I used to swing golf clubs. Sorry, I got off track, squirrel. I love that sound of that wind across there. Can you imagine hundreds of priests all at the same time in unison waving their lulavs, okay? This brushy stuff that they're carrying. It was the sound of the wind. The word for wind was ruach which is spirit in Hebrew. It was, so as they're doing this, it is anticipation of the pouring out of God's spirit and the sound of the wind. And Israel is expecting that messianic day in which God would pour out his spirit in this situation. And so in chapter two, verse 17, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. So church family, that's not just the twelve. That's not just the ones that were in the upper room. What was it, the 120, I believe? The men and the women that were in the upper room praying when the Spirit came. That promise is for all God's people in all God's church. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my Spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I had to memorize that one as a little kid, right? Because it talks about baptism. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, into the name of Jesus for the, for rem- the remission forgiveness of your sins. And then it says, and you will receive. Doesn't that just sound good? That sounds amazing, doesn't it? That phrase, you will receive. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it gets even better. Acts 2.39. I need to like 2.39 more than 2.38. This promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. For all. Doesn't that sound good? For all whom the Lord our God will call. And so, here's what we're going to do in the next weeks ahead. We're going to talk about, very specifically, how the Spirit matures us 
into and produces in us Christ likeness. Right? We want to be like Christ. And so we're going to talk about how is it that the Spirit works within the heart to produce the character of Jesus, liberating us from patterns of sin and bringing us into greater freedom and glory in the Lord. And additionally to that, we're going to talk about how important it is for the spiritual gifts of the Spirit to be worked out in every one of your lives. Because together we make up the body of Christ. And the Spirit distributes spiritual giftings to all members of the Lord's body so that everyone can be strengthened and built up in Him. And so we're going to talk about how do I change as a person person how do i walk in the giftings of the spirit so that the church can be the fullness ephesians 1 the fullness of him who fills isn't that an interesting metaphor the full who fills who pours out the fullness of him who fills everything in every way so i'm really excited about the days ahead The scriptures in the Old Testament prophesied about the giving of the Spirit. Jesus told us this is the centerpiece for the Christian, the believer's life. He told the woman at the well. He tells the people, living water, living water, the Spirit that is going to be poured out. We see it in Acts chapter 2 that it's given to the church. And throughout the book of Acts, the church makes incredible progress because of the Spirit at work in the life of the believers. We are not under the old way of the written code. The written code, any written code, does not make us righteous, and it does not produce the righteous life in us. But we, church family, are in the new way of the Spirit, and that God will produce in us. Isn't it interesting? In the New Testament, it doesn't say, keep the rules. Paul says in Galatians, he says, walk by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit live by the spirit it's a completely different framework for the believer's life where god does amazing and glorious things in our life we extend right now the invitation church family if god has touched your life today or if there's a way we can serve you through prayer whatever your needs are we have this time of invitation i think we'll have some elders come down uh, to receive you y'all let's all stand and Give our glory to God. If we can serve you, make your way down.